small island developing states, a view from Pacific. Honorable Ministers of Finance, the Secretary General for the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat, Under Secretary General of the United Nations and Executive Secretary of ASCAP, the Under Secretary General of the United Nations and Executive Secretary for ACLAC, Multilateral and Bilateral Development Partners, Excellencies. To commence our side event today, our first opening remark will be from the ASCAP Executive Secretary, Ms. Amida Salshia Alish Jabana, the Under Secretary General of the United Nations and Executive Secretary of ASCAP. Without further ado, she will be delivering her remarks via video for us today. Thank you. Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the ECOSO Financing for Development site event on addressing debt challenges in the small island developing states fused from the Pacific. The event is a follow-up of the Pacific Regional Debt Conference co-convened by Fiji and Tuvalu and co-organized by ESCAP and the Pacific Island Forum Secretariat at the beginning of this month. The objectives of the site event are to disseminate the outcomes of the Pacific Debt Conference to a broader audience, to enhance understanding of the debt challenges of the Pacific and Caribbean sites, and to explore solutions to those challenges. The Pacific Debt Conference provided a forum for debtors, creditors, and development partners to discuss options and strategies to address the debt vulnerabilities of the Pacific sites. The conference highlighted the rising risk of debt stress in the Pacific sites caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. It noted with concern that interest rate hikes in developed countries and the Ukraine crisis could further exacerbate their challenges in servicing external debts. The conference also noted that the Pacific sites suffer from significant damages and losses from natural disasters, which are becoming more frequent and severe due to climate change, resulting in weakened fiscal positions as well as increases in public debts. The challenges of the Pacific sites in servicing public debts are not unique. Sites in the Caribbean and other regions are also extremely vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, and other global disruptions. We need to find common solutions. In this regard, I'm very pleased by the participation in this event of high-level policymakers from both the Pacific and the Caribbean. I would like to express my appreciation to our partners, ECLA and the Pacific Island Forum Secretariat for your support for making this event a success. I look forward to your deliberations, proposed solutions for the seats of the Pacific and the Caribbean to address that debt challenges. ESCAP stands ready to support our members and work with sister organizations like ECLA and PIPS in implementing actionable recommendations to make public debt sustainable and achieve the SDGs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Amida. We now move on to the second opening remark for our side event today to be delivered by Fiji's permanent representative to the United Nations, His Excellency, Mr. Satendra Prasad. Thank you very much, uh, moderator, USG Amida, uh, ministers and excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Pleasure to be with all of you at this uh, uh, very important ECOSOC uh, side, uh, side event that is focusing on Pacific Regional Debt Conference uh, uh, on the outcomes which was convened earlier uh, this, uh, uh, this month. Thank you also for bringing Caribbean and Pacific family together at uh, these crucial discussions. I believe that these discussions will ultimately shape the well-being, recovery, and indeed stability of small states across our sea of islands. Our Blue Pacific uh, continent is facing extraordinary circumstances, as indeed are the Caribbean states. 
the COVID-19 pandemic has posed significant challenges for all our governments, reversing development progress, harming the key drivers of growth. The scale of economic contraction in, in the Pacific have been amongst the steepest in the world. Employment and income le uh, levels have declined substantially in, uh, in directly and indirectly affected sectors. Women's economic security has been dimin diminished. Gender-based violence is, uh, on, on, unfortunately, is on, on the uh, increase. The uh, region, the Pacific region, is still in the throes of uh, COVID pandemic. Only a few are now, have now opened up, uh, Fiji and Palau leading, uh, leading the charge. And as they recover, they continue to be exposed to climate and natural disasters. In this uh, context, governments have implemented far-reaching policy measures to create the fiscal space and restructure public debt in, in the ways in which they could. And the Pacific uh, Regional Debt Conference was a very important uh, debt co conference that allowed Pacific's leaders uh, to take stock of, uh, of where the region is. But no one could have predicted the scale and impact of the Russian invasion of, on Ukraine on the, and its impacts on Pacific and small states. Overnight, food and energy bills doubled in some cases, rising to as much as four to 5% of, of, uh, of uh, the government expenditures. Uh, forum economic ministers in the, in the debt conference have provided some indicative pathways at that meeting. They stressed the need for debt instruments to be simple, implementable, and, uh, and stress the case for, uh, for speed. Uh, they stress the need for G20 to deliver a new framework that extends the 2020 uh, decisions uh, made. They stress the need for enhanced flexibility in, in financing modalities and for ultra, uh, consideration of ultra-long-term ultra financing options. Uh, uh, several uh, countries have put forward uh, options for blue, green and SDG bonds and have asked the question, can development partners help countries taking these innovations to, uh, to reduce the cost of borrowing. At both IMF and the World Bank, we see uh, that an urgency is set, uh, sadly lacking, perhaps another collateral victim of the Ukraine crisis. Several leaders, uh, Pacific leaders, including uh, Fijian Minister for Economy has made very strong appeals for urgency, speed and scale uh, in a cohesive global response at this uh, Finance for Development uh, uh, Forum that is underway. The, ECOSOC this year is hugely uh, consequential for small island states. Today's event will give us specific ambassadors, uh, uh, ministers at the UN and our Caribbean counterparts, some insights into how far our leaders want us to go and how far they want us to push the international system. We, but believe, believe me, we are pushing as much as we can. Let me assure you of, of that. I really welcome this joint uh, Caribbean and Pacific effort. We look forward to further guidance and inputs on the way forward in shaping an urgent glo uh, global cohesive response to the intertwined climate, COVID and debt crisis that has its sharpest and most intense impacts on SIDS. On behalf of Pacific ambassadors at the UN, I once again uh, thank organizers uh, and all, all participants for joining us in this very important discussions. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now proceed to the next part of our program. Our next uh, session will be made up of short presentations consisting of three presenters. With your indulgence, please allow me to introduce them and we will proceed to uh, the back-to-back -back interventions this morning. Our first presentation will be from Sheldon McLean, the coordinator for the Economic Development Unit for ECLAC sub-regional headquarters in the Caribbean, followed by Alberto Iswood, the Acting Chief Financing for Development Section, NASCAP, be followed by Mr. Denton Marawa, Senior Advisor for Economics from the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat. We now hand over to Mr. McLean. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Um, for now. Um, can, we, can we pull up the, the presentation? Sure. Thank you very much. Um, 
my presentation will quickly explore some of the key features of the Caribbean's debt, debt challenge and associated structural imbalances as, that are still to see. And I'll tell you to provide some context for, for the depending um, panel discussion and also explore the notion of a Caribbean Resilience Fund as a, a, a remedy, a remedy for see. Um, the next slide. The, the, the Caribbean has increasingly been conditioned, been conditioned by um, a high debt, a low growth nexus. Um, where where we're looking at the, the, the chart to the left, we've seen that over the last two decades, the Caribbean's debt has averaged over seventy percent of GDP. But more worrying um, is that is that both debt and growth are trending in the wrong direction. And there has been a, a, a downward structural shift in economic growth in the Caribbean, um, averaging a 3.7% um, in the seven years prior to global financial crisis and 0% um, since, since then, um, during the period 2009 to, to 2021. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> Even more worrying is that if you look at the chart, is that Caribbean many Caribbean member states have consistently generated um, fiscal fiscal de deficits. Um, we the this the, the bubbles, um, the size of the bubbles um, in the chart will would illustrate growth rates. We see Montserrat, Guyana at at, at just around nineteen percent, um, Anguilla, um, Antigua and Barbuda as well, just over five percent. Um, registering significant um, positive growth in, 20, in 2021. Um, the silver bubbles show negative growth. So we've seen St. Kitts and Nevis and Suriname having negative growth um, and sluggishly um, recovering from the COVID the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. But we also see a, a, a cluster of, of Caribbean member states, 13 out of the 15 Caribbean member states having, um, having debt to GDP ratios above 60, 60%. We see a cluster of, of countries, Belize, Bahamas, um, Dominica, St. Vincent, St. Lucia, Trinidad and Tobago, um, having significantly high, significantly high uh, levels of, 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 of public debt, um, averaging well over 80%, while generating uh, fiscal deficits, which would continue to, to fuel um, their, their borrowing requirements. We also have to add to this, dilemma, the fact that um, by looking at the structure of the Caribbean debt, there's a certain level of heterogeneity, which makes a one-size-fits-all or universal solution improbable. The fact that the, the debt has increasingly conditioned by high interest rates, um, commonly above 10%, and also high uh, debt servicing costs, which average 24% of government revenue, and as high as 77% in Antigua and Barbuda. Uh, reducing fiscal space for resilience, for, for resilience building and achieving the SDGs. Uh, next slide. As a consequence, ICLAC has been actively involved in the financing for development um, in the area of COVID um, discourse, um, presenting and, and co-sponsoring many, many um, proposals, including a, a broad spectrum of state contingent debt instruments, including um, hurricane clauses, and more particularly, um, advocating the establishment of a Caribbean Resilience Fund and, 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 yes, and also the enacting of a uh, uh, skilled up um, debt for climate adaptation as well. Next slide. The Caribbean Resilience Fund has been among all, all of these proposals, has been the one that seems to have the most traction. ECLAC has made considerable um, progress with, with regard to establishing the Caribbean Resilience Fund. For, for us, any solution to the Caribbean's debt challenge? And also structural imbalances need to need to, need to address all these all these issues in simultaneously. We are seeing the CRF being evolving as a pan Caribbean segregated portfolio fund, um, being housed within the Caribbean the, the Caribbean Development Bank. What we're working at now is granular granularity. Um, our work has always been data data heavy. Um, the three windows um, seek to address three major structural challenges. 
um, the environmental, building environmental uh, um, or climate change um, resilience. Um, and window two, in thinking um, funding to restructure the Caribbean economy and, and, and fuel growth and, and increasing competitiveness. In, in terms of the numbers, we're thinking that the initial capitalization we're looking for is in the area of 10.6 billion, um, maybe in three to five year cycles. In the, in the Caribbean, we've estimated it takes about 3.5 to 4% to um, capital investment to, to get 1% um, positive growth. Using those figures, the, the initial capitalization for Windows 1 and 2 of the CRF is in the area of, of 3.7 billion. Um, Windows 3 uh, seeks to address liquidity and, and debt, particularly through uh, our debt for climate adaptation adaptation swap. We, we understand that it's difficult to separate these, 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 these trends, but um, to a large extent, we are moving, we're moving forward and we're hoping that we can, we can um, scale up the, the analysis and, and have something, uh, a final, final structure um, by, by summer to move towards capitali capitalization. Um, it's, it's important to have a, a, a deeper look at the, the debt liquidity and debt on window, window three. Um, next slide. In order to assess the feasibility of our proposed um, debt for climate adaptation swap in, in window three, we have selected uh, three pilot countries, Antigua and Barbuda, St. Lucia and St. Vincent. Uh, 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 again, our analysis has been data heavy. In order to achieve 1% growth, we believe that we need to reduce the regions that the, the, the debt of individual member states by 12.2 percentage points, a GDP, a G to GDP ratio. For the three for the three pilot countries, we think that this is upward of 15 15 percent of the total debt. Um, we are currently working on on modeling um, the potential debt 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 conversions. We have identified low hanging fruit in terms of um, categories of debt that are ripe for harvest. Um, we find maybe Paris Club debt and Petro Caribe um, debt for Antigua and Barbuda and, and, and to that to this extent. And, and given the fact that uh, within recent time, um, several Caribbean economies have their debts stuck, um, greater than 50%, above 50% of their stock being held domestically. Um, that any, any solution must treat with the domestic and private debt, um, which is usually extremely difficult when they come to debt, uh, the debt, debt um, restructuring, reprofiling uh, ne ne negotiations. Um, we're hoping that this the Caribbean Resilience Fund and the debt swap can be the proverbial camel's nose that opens the tent to a broader um, access to, to for development financing to build resilience and 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 address um, and reduce and address the debt of the challenges of, of the region. Um, I think. Uh, I think um, I will end there, and I hope that this informs the, the 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 context, a broader context, for the panel discussion. Um, thank you. So uh, I go next. Uh, can I share my video, please? My uh... My presentation, please, on the screen. Thank you so much. Uh, well, I'm going to uh, just present a very, very brief comparison of some debt indicators in the, in the Caribbean and the Pacific. Uh, the reason for that is just because there are some differences in the two regions, although there are many commonalities. And I think that uh, we need to take this into account, you know, in the discussions that we are going to have. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, the first one is about the public debt to GDP ratio that uh, uh, you can see that is, is generally larger uh, for the Caribbean. The median is 83.9% of the GDP, while for the Pacific it's only 47.4% uh, of the GDP. Uh, this doesn't mean that uh, the, the Pacific is having less trouble. Uh, we are going to, to discuss this in the, in the next slide. 
Next slide, please. The next one is about the external debt, the public external debt, or more precisely the public and publicly guaranteed external debt. And uh, this is a different source. The previous one was based on, uh, on local sources, IMF. This is based on the World Bank uh, International Debt uh, Statistics. And the latest is only 2020. But uh, you can also see the, the same situation that the Caribbean system to have a higher debt, external debt in this case, as a proportion of the GDP, 85% for the median compared to 29% for the Pacific. But the other interesting uh, aspect of this figure is the composition of the debt, because in the case of the Pacific, most of the countries have only debt with official creditors, with bi multilateral and also bilateral creditors. An exception is Papua New Guinea, who has some, some debt with uh, private creditors. Uh, Fiji used to have some debt with uh, bondholders, but it was retired uh, by 2020. Um, in the case of the Pacific, there is more reliance, although not all countries, on, the, um, on debt from private creditors, uh, particularly bondholders are particularly important. And this is common in, the, in general, globally, uh, for middle income countries across the world. Next slide. So this one is about the, even though I mentioned that the Pacific has relatively lower um, uh, debt to GDP ratios, the debt for GDP ratio is not the, the only indicator uh, for a risk of debt distress. So this is data from the IMF and World Bank uh, debt sustainability analysis and uh, they classify countries according to their risk. Uh, the analysis is done only for countries who are eligible to IDA, mostly. In some cases, they include other countries in their Article 4 consultation, but it's data from the IDA eligible countries. Uh, you can see that uh, for moderate risk, there are two from the Pacific, only one from uh, Caribbean. For high risk, three from the Caribbean. And there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven from the Pacific. So it's uh, more countries that are at high risk, even though the debt to GDP ratios are not that high. Uh, the reason for the disparity is, uh, is, is based on other factors. Uh, the IMF uh, and the World Bank, when they look at the sustainability, they look at the capacity to service debt, and they consider many other indicators. Um, and that is why, I mean, there are these differences. Uh, Grenada is the only country, the only seat between the two regions that is actually in debt distress at the moment. Next slide. I saw that uh, because concessional debt is an important issue to be discussed, I saw that it might be interesting also to, to look at the picture of IDA eligibility uh, for different uh, type of um, concessional lending uh, streams. So there are uh, blended countries, uh, are many of them, most of the Caribbeans are all, almost all blended countries in the Pacific, only Fiji and Papua New Guinea. These are countries who can borrow from IDA, but also from IBRD. Then uh, small economy terms, this is a uh, general for all uh, small island developing states. Um, at least the majority are there. And they are also very convenient uh, terms. And then blended term is something relatively new. Uh, at the moment, we have only Papua New Guinea. But you can see there are many countries who are not eligible to IDA because their debt, you know, their GDP per capita is, is relatively high. And most of them are in the uh, in the Caribbean region. Next. And the final uh, the final chart I want to show you, because I am running out of time. Is the, is the ODA, which uh, again, it is uh, relatively higher or importantly higher, I would say, in the Pacific region, uh, with a median of 18% of the GDP compared to 1.5% of the GDP. However, uh, it is important to keep in mind that this uh, ODA is mostly uh, in-kind support, uh, technical assistance and things like that. So it's not, uh, it's not uh, the majority is not based on grants or, uh, or loans. But anyway, I think that I just wanted to complete the picture of some, some indicators. Uh, so that would be all for me. Uh, next slide. And this is only an advertisement. If you go to the debt conference uh, website, you will find a lot of interesting publications uh, prepared by ESCAP. Thank you so much.
over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alberto. Thank you, uh, uh, Fino. Uh, my presentation will be on the uh, Pacific Resilience Facility. Uh, we have heard from the Caribbean, the facility, uh, and this is the Pacific uh, Resilience Facility. What is the Pacific Resilience Facility? Next slide, please. It's a, uh, a regional financing facility, mainly grant, uh, grant financing. Uh, this facility expects a, a capital base of uh, 1.5 uh, billion US. And this uh, facility has been endorsed by Pacific uh, Forum leaders, uh, as well as uh, Pacific Economic Ministers in 2019. And the objective is to build community resilience uh, to prepare for the advent of uh, serious uh, uh, disasters and climate uh, change uh, risks. So we're looking at uh, uh, before the event, we build uh, resilience in our rural Pacific uh, communities. Next slide, please. Uh, th this, uh, in terms of the context, uh, why we're doing this, uh, there's an existing gap in terms of the uh, uh, the uh, disaster risk financing uh, options provided. Uh, uh, in the region. At the moment, it's all uh, after the event, after the disaster. Uh, that's when the disaster risk financings are triggered. Uh, there's limited uh, disaster risk financing at the community level uh, and also uh, the need to provide a small scale, low quantum uh, disaster risk uh, uh, preparedness. In terms of uh, two compelling issues, uh, climate emergency, as we all know in the Pacific, is the greatest uh, threat to the region. And every year we have uh, substantial disasters. Uh, and the other issue is uh, uh, in terms of debt sustainability, as you show from the previous slides, uh, the Pacific is already facing uh, high debt uh, uh, high levels of de uh, debt distress, so we do not want to add on to this. And so the facility is mainly a grant uh, facility provided to rural communities uh, that are vulnerable to disaster risk. Next slide, please. Uh, these are some of the projects or kind of projects that uh, the PRF would, would, would support, uh, community halls, uh, that can be used as evacuation centers uh, during disasters, uh, infrastructure, small infrastructure like jetties, uh, early warning systems, uh, ICT infrastructure, uh, planting of mangroves, uh, for example, and water energy and uh, logistic centers uh, during uh, disasters. So these are sort of examples of the kind of uh, projects that the PRF can support in the region. Next slide, please. So we, at this stage, we're trying to capitalize the facility uh, to raise the 1.5 billion US dollars. And we're modeling this on two uh, previous uh, examples of uh, uh, pledging events, the Caribbean in 2017, uh, which raised 3.2 billion and the Mozambique uh, example in 2019, which raised uh, 1.2 billion US dollars. Uh, 1.5 uh, billion US dollar target represents 1% uh, of, uh, of the region's uh, GDP. And we're trying to, uh, 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 trying to uh, address the loss, potential losses of 3% uh, 3, 3 of GDP of the region. Next slide, please. 
just on the governance structure, uh, we have a council of members, which is represented by the 18 foreign countries uh, at ministerial level, Minister of Finance, Minister of Economy. Uh, but there is uh, five, five uh, uh, seats on the council that's uh, reserved for donors, development partners, especially those that contribute, who would contribute to the Pacific Resilience Facility. And of course, uh, a board of trustees, CEO and the key management uh, uh, positions are also included in the structure. Next slide, please. So at this stage, as I mentioned earlier, we are uh, working towards a pledging event uh, planned for October with the uh, assistance of the uh, Office of the UN Secretary General. And uh, this is uh, the target for, for, for the year. And at this stage, we are working uh, in terms of uh, conducting awareness and uh, outreach with our member countries and also uh, consulting with uh, our development partners to uh, solicit their support, their financial commitments towards the pledging event that will be held later in the year. And to assist uh, us do this, we have uh, engaged the uh, Right Honourable Helen Clark, who was former Prime Minister of New Zealand and former head of the UNDP uh, and with her uh, high profile, we believe it would be a very, uh, she would uh, contribute uh, a lot to the uh, fundraising efforts that we are undertaking at the moment. Next slide, please. Oh, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to um, Sheldon, uh, Alberto and Denton for your uh, short but very insightful presentations. Against this backdrop, uh, Excellencies and ladies and gentlemen, we shall now proceed to the next session uh, for our high level round table. The round table will be moderated by Mr. Selwyn Charles Hart. Um, a privilege to have Mr. Hart uh, moderating this side event. Uh, Mr. Hart is a special advisor to the United Nations Secretary General on Climate Action and the Assistant Secretary General for the Climate Action Team. So over to you. Thank you so much and good evening from New York. Um, really great to see um, all of you. And first, let me thank um, my colleagues from UNET CLAC and SCAP. Um, our um, resident coordinator um, in the Pacific region and our colleagues from the Pacific Island Forum and all of you um, for attending and participating in this really important side event. Um, my task will be easy. It will be simply to pass the floor um, to these very distinguished um, um, panelists who will delve into many of the issues that have been raised here um, already during this really important event. What we see in the Caribbean and in the Pacific, in fact, all of the small island developing states or countries um, on the cusp of really severe debt distress, um, countries that um, continue to suffer generally from low growth rates, um, limited fiscal space, and really um, a hostile external environment. These countries are also on the front lines of the climate crisis. And just a few weeks ago, we received working group to um, report on vulnerability and impacts from the intergovernmental panel on climate change, which identified all small island developing states as part of the global hotspots for the climate crisis. And we know the challenges that all sits face in terms of impacts disproportionately, in terms of impacts from climate change and the costs that climate change continues to pose to these countries. The IPCC also makes it clear that we're not on target to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. We're not on target 
to limit temperature rise to 1.5, which will add um, further burdens to the small island developing states and low-lying coastal states that are part of these two regions. So th these are the challenges that uh, both regions face, and it's absolutely essential, absolutely essential that all of you continue to be strong advocates for both regions who face many similar channel um, challenges, um, including um, the challenge of lack of access to concessional and grant financing to make the necessary investments in the sustainable development goals and also to build climate resilience. So I will now pass the floor to our first panelist, the distinguished Minister of Finance of Guyana, um, Minister Singh. And my question to you is that Guyana has experienced debt challenges in the past and you've managed to overcome them with the support of the HIPIC initiative, uh, which is led by the IMF and, and the World Bank. And based on your country's experiences and in the current context, what do you think are the broad elements of a strategy for SIDS to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic and to invest in climate adaptation while also simultaneously achieving debt sustainability. Really good to see you, Minister Singh, and over to you, sir. Uh, th thank you very much, Selwyn, and it's uh, good, to, good to see you too and good to be on this panel with you. Um, good uh, evening from Georgetown, um, Guyana, and greetings to our friends and brothers on the other side of the, of the world and others participating from elsewhere, including, of course, at UN uh, HQ. Um, let me say, first of all, that the challenges that are faced by our brothers and sisters in the Pacific are by no means unfamiliar to us in the Caribbean. Like you just said, Selwyn, um, the circumstances of the small island develop developing states in the Pacific are, in fact, very, very similar to the circumstances that we face in the Caribbean, including, of course, the inherent vulnerabilities of smallness, of size, um, the absence of uh, domestic economies of scale, remoteness from our major trading par partners, limited human resources, um, and so many other challenges that have been limited, op uh, limited opportunities for um, productive uh, diversification, and so, so many of the other challenges that have been so well documented. So we in the Caribbean, um, can relate in a very direct way to the challenges that are being faced um, in the Pacific, because we face those very challenges in our region, including, of course, I should have mentioned acute, extraordinary vulnerability to, the, to, to, to climate change. You quite rightly pointed out, Selwyn, that you, we, we faced a lot of this pain in Guyana. I speak from a country where we started out uh, with, 30 years ago, we started out at a point where we had a debt to GDP ratio of 600%, in excess of 600%. We are now at a point where our debt to GDP ratio is less than 40%. And that has required tremendous effort on a number of fronts. And I want to mention just a few main thematic or to uh, to uh, topics for consideration. Um, but the first point that I want to make is in terms of recovery from COVID-19, the first imperative, of course, for all of our countries has to be to keep our people safe and healthy, protect them from COVID-19, and to get to a point where our economies can be reopened as quickly as possible. That will involve some fiscal dislocation in the short term. It has resulted in fiscal dislocation in the short term, but the imperative of keeping people safe is paramount. Looking beyond the most immediate uh, crises, uh, COVID-19, of course, and now the global economic situation occasioned by the uh, war in Ukraine, uh, there are a couple of critical issues that I want to mention from the standpoint of the, the, the question of um, strategies to be adopted to confront the inherent vulnerabilities that we face. The first is, of course, resource mobilization. And in particular here, external resource mobilization. The reality is that because of the intrinsic and peculiar vulnerability of small island developing states, 
the international community, if it is to be faithful to the objective of economic uh, resilience and economic growth and poverty reduction as a global public good, the international community has a shared responsibility for ensuring that the most vulnerable states of the world are provided with the support that they uh, need to be provided to achieve some um, level of resilience. And you mentioned, Selwyn, in your introductory remarks, uh, some of the pressing issues that face us as small island, vulnerable small island developing states, including in particular questions related to eligibility for um, concessional resources, eligibility for development financing. And I'm going to come back to that matter in a minute. But most immediately, there has to be an aggressive external resource mobilization strategy engaging all of the development partners um, with the objective, first of all, of addressing the unsustainable debt burden that some of our countries have, including through debt relief where needed, and including through delivery of additional affordable development financing. And so I was happy to see in the last presentation the reference to the pledging event that's planned for the Pacific in October 2022. I think that's an extremely important um, event and you know it speaks to the question of stepping up efforts to mobilize development support to address uh, the intrinsic vulnerabilities that our countries face so the first point that i'd make is of course external resource mobilization the second point that i'd make is looking ahead it's unavoidable that our countries will have to make the domestic policy choices that are needed to address in the medium and longer term the intrin these intrinsic vulnerabilities to which we refer. Um, and the reality is that sustainable addressing the economic challenges that we face in a sustainable manner will require us devising an economic model that speaks to these intrinsic vulnerabilities. So here I'm, 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 I'm talking about things like addressing the inherent vulnerabilities in our productive sector. Historically, many of our economies have been monosectoral economies. Many of our economies are dominated by uh, tourism, certainly in the Caribbean and indeed in the Pacific as well. This is something that we have to address. We have to address the fact that any economy that is, uh, that is heavily dependent on a single sector will have an extraordinary level of vulnerability. And so we need to put our heads together in the Caribbean and in the Pacific to address the question of how we diversify our real sector, our productive sector, whether it is the knowledge-based economy, whether it is information and communications technology, um, whether it is leveraging our blue economy, our blue resources, in the Caribbean and in the Pacific, we have vast amounts of um, blue resources, the oceanic resources. In some of our countries, we have forest resources like in Guyana, putting our heads together to addressing how we can confront this question of real sector diversification. Related to that, of course, is domestic revenue mobilization, addressing questions of fiscal sustainability from the domestic standpoint, domestic revenue mobilization, expenditure reprioritization and rationalization to address to make a domestic contribution, a demonstrated domestic contribution to achieving fiscal sustainability. And the final point I would make is the importance for international solidarity. We in the Caribbean and in the Pacific have some shared challenges and we have some shared interests, including on things like the multidimensional vulnerability index which should inform, and this is something that I feel very strongly about, vulnerability has to be incorporated into the criteria for eligibility for development resources. And we need to speak with a single unified voice on this and the other issues that are of, in, including issues such as the blue economy, issues in which we have a shared interest. We need in the Caribbean and in the Pacific to speak with a single shared voice on these pressing issues of interest uh, on the international agenda. I'm going to have to stop there because I don't want to overrun my time uh, on Julie. 
but um, but I'm happy to discuss these issues uh, further uh, if given an opportunity. Thanks again, Selwyn, and thank you very much, colleagues, for giving me this opportunity. Always a pleasure to see you, Minister, and thank you so much for your very um, insightful comments. Um, you you, you um, really stress the need um, for there to be uh, um, actions taken at multiple levels. Um, your point on um, a major effort on external resource mobilization, it's absolutely critical. Um, this must, of course, be married with um, the point that, that you made on domestic um, policy reforms to diversify the um, productive sectors and also to focus on domestic resource mobilization. And what ties everything together really is international solidarity, where we work across regions, um, but also we need a supportive international, SIDS need a supportive international environment, one that incorporates issues related to vulnerability and size in determining access and eligibility to concessionary and grant financing. So thank you again, Minister. Um, I, I know that you might have, have to leave early, but we hope that you can stay on for a bit longer when we get to the question and answer session. I now give the floor to, to the Attorney General and Minister of Economy, Civil Service and Communications of Fiji. Um, the floor is yours, Minister Syed Kayum. Really great to see you. Last time I saw you was in Glasgow where, where you um, really um, um, took the fight um, on behalf of the Pacific Island nations. Minister, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, um, and pleasure to be here, Bulevinaka, to everybody. Um, I, I'll, I'll try and be as brief as possible, but before the pandemic, of course, you know, we had nine years of conservative growth, which obviously helped us going into the pandemic. Uh, but notwithstanding that, Fiji recorded its largest ever economic contraction of about 17.2% in 2020, with a further 4.1% contraction in 2021. The tourism sector is highlighted earlier on by the Honourable Minister, you know, contributes almost 40% towards our economy, brings in about $2 billion in foreign exchange annually. It was at, at least at a complete standstill for about two years. Over 100,000 Fijians lost their jobs or had reduced hours. Government tax collections were on average declined by 50%, of course, putting immense pressure on government finances. And at the same time, there's a need to sustain expenditures at pre-pandemic levels to ensure that there's no major disruption, for example, to public services. And indeed, there's demand for public services, in particular in the health sector. And we had to cater for almost uh, 500 million Fijian dollars in unemployment support and other uh, relief measures. Uh, government revenue uh, fell by 50%. We lost almost about uh, Fijian $1.4 billion in 12 months, a cumulative of about $2.8 billion of the, of the last two years. So government acted significantly in order to maintain public expenditure, in order to ensure that socioeconomic stability I had to borrow about $2 billion in the last two financial years, pushing the debt to GDP ratio up to around 80%. Uh, it was well below 50%, uh, about mid forties. Um, and then of course, apart from the increased borrowings, the decline in nominal GDP also uh, in, induced a sharp uh, increase in the debt to GDP ratio. We, of course, you know, had to uh, ensure that there was strategy in place. We simply could not risk the alternative of not borrowing uh, to support the economy during the last 20 months. The economic decline would have been even catastrophic, even further catastrophic, with a much more severe impact on social economic front if we did not actually invest uh, in the economy, and that was funded by way of loans. Uh, it was quite clear that our counter-cyclical stance to support the economy with additional debt was in fact appropriate, and that is why our multilateral partners in fact stepped in to support Fiji with additional external de debt during this period. Uh, furthermore, with the largest foreign exchange on tourism almost uh, completely shut down for two, two years, we ran the risk of a large devaluation of government had not sourced external debt and budget support from you know, our multilateral and bilateral partners and secured foreign investment in one of our energy companies. A devaluation, of course, in the middle of all of this, one, and in particular in the middle of a health crisis, would have further exacerbated our existing socioeconomic challenges. Our government is securing this external funding and borrowings, budget support, and some divestment, not only support of foreign reserves, but also help increase liquidity in the domestic market, 
which in turn reduced our interest costs on domestic borrowings. It has also helped keep the interest rate environment low, which is critical for economic recovery. And we're seeing some people already taking advantage of it, in particular after we opened up our borders on the 1st of December uh, last year. I mean, I think the point to make is that if our lenders, which include ADB, World Bank, and JICA, and Asian Infrastructure Bank, are willing to lend us, you know, lend to us about five times more than what they were lending before, that signals their full confidence in, uh, in our ability to repay the debt. But it also means that our debt is sustainable. Uh, otherwise, why would anyone lend to us uh, in particular? Secondly, it reaffirms our policy response to COVID-19 was appropriate. That is why we we're all willing to, they're all willing to partner with Fiji. We want the at the one of the highest rates of vaccination uh, rate in, in the developing world. We achieved uh, 92% fairly quickly. Uh, and of course, our development partners in, in the region, Australia and New Zealand, did provide uh, direct budget support also with some of the policy-based reforms to be carried out. Um, over, apart from this, we have borrowed highly concessional debt. The overall cost of debt has significantly declined. In the last two years, we secured almost $900 million in highly concessional finance, uh, tagged to policy reforms with long-lasting impacts from multilateral and bilateral partners. Highly concessional loans at 40-year terms, 10-year grace period, 0.01% interest rate, means that these loans have a grant element of about 60%. And I'll come to that as to how we view that later on. And also the current yields in the domestic market and government securities are also at all-time low. We have you know, three-month T-bills at 0.06%, for example, one-year T-bills at 0.13%, etc. cetera. Um, there is no doubt that uh, debt levels have increased substantially, not only in Fiji, but also in every other country, and more so in small island developing economies that were particularly heavily reliant on tourism. Uh, we cannot continue to borrow this space indefinitely, so what do we do now? Uh, we need, of course, fiscal reforms. There's an urgent need now more than ever to bring about fiscal reforms to enhance tax administration and cut out spending efficacy and streamline government uh, operations with prudent and transparent uh, public debt management. Uh, we have strengthened our Financial Management Act to bring about greater transparency and accountability. We've introduced a medium-term debt management framework approved by Cabinet. It's published on our website. Uh, we are working on medium-term fiscal management framework uh, to bring down debt levels. This includes uh, relooking at the tax regime to ensure revenue adequacy on a sustainable basis. Uh, we've in fact had to restructure the VAT regime recently uh, to also in ensure that we have affordability uh, built into this matrix because uh, with the rising you know, inflation rates, we need to ensure that ordinary regions are able to access or, you know, goods and services at reasonable pricing. Uh, we've also have various options for further divestment uh, and getting more private sector participation. In, in fact, at the moment, we have a public-private partnership in the hospital system, when Australian companies participate through our IFC-led uh, international tender process. Now, fiscal consolidation is necessary, but the speed of the implementation actually has to be carefully planned and sequenced. Tax reforms, for example, have to be well-timed to ensure that there is no disruption to the tenuous economic recovery. We also have to be mindful of inflation and cost of living as we are seriously suffering from international price pressures. You know, I note that next week the price of fuel will, shot, will shoot through the roof again. The scaling down of public expenditure actually has to be carefully managed with focus on eff uh, efficiency and the prioritization of high rate, uh, high return spending. A concessional finance should also continue. Our multilateral development partners and other lenders must continue to support us with access to concessional finance and climate funds. In fact, for us, development finance and climate finance actually means the same thing. Uh, fortunately, we've managed to get access to World Bank, um, IDA funds, JICA, and now ADB for concessional debt. Uh, and we simply cannot afford to be burdened with costly debt continuously. Um, measuring debt sustainability, of course, is a technical and complex issue. Uh, the most common way, of course, to, is to compare debt levels across countries to look at the debt to GDP ratio. Uh, there is no magic number for the debt to GDP ratio as an indicator of debt sustainability, because the debt to GDP ratio does not give you the full picture about the debt portfolio itself. It is you know, useful mainly to compare debt levels across countries, but it does not say much about debt sustainability of individual countries. I think to really understand debt sustainability, you have to look at other factors like the cost of debt, the ability to refinance debt when it falls due, the availability of foreign exchange when an external debt has to be paid, the profile or the quantity of future debt repayments, 
the level of debt revenues to service the debt, the purpose of the debt, understanding who the lenders are and what are the lending terms and conditions, what is the state of the economy and the future economic plans, and what are the consequences the government decides not to borrow among, other, from among, among others. For Fiji, we borrowed over $900 million, as I mentioned earlier on. More than 10, uh, more than 10 percent of our debt portfolio is now in highly concessional terms, equating to over 60 percent grant element. The World Bank and JICO has lent to Fiji at 40-year terms, 10-year grace periods, and net uh, and near zero interest rates. This means we do not have to make principal repayments for the first 10 years. Again, this 900 million dollars in concessional terms cannot be compared to say 900 million dollars borrowed in the past and say between 7 to 10 percent for 10-year or 15-year terms. In 2006, for example, the then government borrowed over $320 million for the issuance of a global bond with a coupon of 6.875%. The entire $320 million is due to be repaid in a lump sum after five years. This risk profile of the five-year bond was far higher than the JICA debt we've just borrowed. Repayment spread over 40 years and interest at 0.01%. So therefore, the debt to GDP ratio simply cannot capture all of these key factors. Therefore, we need to take a more nuanced approach when measuring the sustainability of our debt. And indeed, when assessing what type of fiscal space any economy has or government has in terms of preparation of the budget and indeed the ability to spend. Fiji, of course, supports the call for the IMF and the World Bank uh, to explore and, uh, and propose well-structured debt for, or for nature swaps or other structural financing changes. We urge the World Bank, IMF, and other multilateral institutions to ensure that eligibility for the climate-related programs and funding is based on our climate vulnerability and not on our OECD uh, income status. We had a cycle of in 2016 that wiped off one third of the value of our GDP in not a year, but in 36 hours. Uh, and we call, of course, on the MDBs to take a more nuanced and sophisticated approach to the assessments of debt sustainability rather than rely on over-simplistic and increasingly irrelevant metrics. Small states, of course, may not have chosen our circumstances. Indeed, we have not, as far as the climate change is concerned. A lot of us are post-colonial states. But indeed, we must refuse to have our future chosen for us. We deserve a voice in the long way to reform the world's debt architecture. And first, of course, the world must choose to hear us. And then I think we'll all be on an evil keel to be able to deal with these issues such as pandemic, and the increasingly insidious nature of climate change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister, and um, thank you really for um, for your very detailed and comprehensive um, elaboration of the strategies taken by your government um, to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. Your point on the international community adopting a more nuanced and sophisticated approach to um, addressing uh, debt sustainability issues um, are well um, 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 taken. And the very concrete example that you gave on the composition of the new debt um, uh, by the government of Fiji really bears home this extremely important point. You also um, uh, um, was fully aligned with the points made by Minister Singh on issues related to um, domestic policy reforms. And I'm sure that our next presenter, my very good friend and former colleague um, at the Caribbean Development Bank, Justin Ram, um, who was the former director of economics at the bank, um, um, will will elaborate on some of these points, um, as well as um, uh, Justin. We also want to hear from you. Get your views on what can be done in very specific terms um, to address some of the challenges faced by small island developing states, both in the Caribbean and in the Pacific, on financing mechanisms that can work in a small state context because we can't have have cookie cutter approaches as you know very well what are some of the very specific financing mechanisms um you believe can work in the small island developing state context so really great to see you my friend okay uh thank thank you very much uh, Salwin, and it's great to see you as well um 
I want to say um, special good morning or good evening to the other panelists as well and um, the excellencies on this. I want to say a thank you to the organizers for inviting me to, to present to you. Um, I'm just going to focus a bit on what I see is actually critical for us to um, attract the type of financing that we do require at this point in time um, in our development parts. Um, Selvin, at the beginning of your opening statement, you mentioned um, the obvious facts coming out of the latest IPCC reports, which says that we are all vulnerable in small island developing states. Um, I think it's time for us to come to terms with that and to say we need to be able to adapt um, to, to, to climate change. That has to be our ultimate goal at this point in time as since. And so when I think about this, um, uh, Selwyn, um, it is critical that we think about the type of financing and the quantum of financing that will be required in order for us to adapt uh, to climate change and to help us to build that resilience. I think in, um, in Sheldon McLean's presentation, he indicated the quantum resources that the Caribbean is looking at. And in fact, if we really think about it, the amount of resources that we need to build adaptation and resilience is actually going to be multiples of what um, Sheldon actually put up on, on, on his slides. So I think that what we have to start doing is to think about how we can convert our adaptation projects into investment opportunities. Um, because ultimately, um, from some of the earlier presentations, it is clear that we also need to grow our economies. So I think we need to be operating on parallel tracks here, whereby we are trying to adapt to climate change, but at the same time using those projects to spur the type of growth that we need um, within our economies. Now, it means that we need to attract a lot of capital. Now, I think we have to be honest and understand that there's no way that we're going to get this type of capital um, from the multilateral community. It's just, not, it's just not coming our way. And more so particularly for the Caribbean because of our high, um, high GDP per capita numbers. So what we have to do is try to attract the levels of private finance. And that is where the quantum of these resources are likely to come from. So the role of the state, I think here, must switch. It must now switch to being one of transformational and it must be strategic. So the state should no longer, in my mind, be seeking to be the sole raiser of finance for climate change adaptation, but actually to be the facilitator, to facilitate the levels of finance that we need because the quantum of resources that we require will ultimately have to come, I think, from the private sector. So I think, when I think about it, I think that the state needs to become an, ad an adaptation regulator, whereby it is the one that is facilitating, changing the laws, changing the rules, making sure that when private sector finance comes in to help us adapt, that those private sector finances can also gain some type of return. And at the same time, we are going to be growing our economies as well. So for example, I'm thinking that if we have to build sea defenses to adapt to climate change, then how can we turn such an investment opportunity into a bankable and investable opportunity for the private sector? Now, so what does that mean, I think, for the states here? Um, governments would have to then have, I would think, some type of seed financing, provide some technical resources to help us the risk that financing that was going to be required from the private sector. So what we're saying to the state is that you're not going to be the large provider of finance, but you're going to help us facilitate this private sector financing that, 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 that is required. And so Selvin, as I, as, I, as I think about it, I do believe that SIDS across this globe must come together at this point in time and perhaps even consider developing a SIDS capital market whereby, for example, we have private capital going between this global SIDS capital market, which attracts private financing, but 
Why is this so important? Because now we're actually dealing with perhaps SIDS credit ratings. SIDS credit ratings, meaning that credit ratings that are attuned to the realities on the ground within SIDS. So I think we need to consider coming together and developing this type of SIDS capital market whereby we can carve out a space for ourselves and so attract the type of private finance along with some seed finance from the state that will allow us to get the type of finance into investable adaptation projects. So, from, so I've tried to take a slightly different approach where I think that the bulk of resources will have to come from the private sector. And so what's the role of the state? And I think that we all have to come together as SIDS to try to develop that SIDS capital market, which is attuned to our SIDS vulnerabilities. And so have the type of credit ratings and attract the type of finance that we will be required to get into our countries if we are going to adapt to climate change. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Justin. Um, again, um, really good suggestions on how to mobilize private finance um, at, at scale, um, given the challenges that many of the SIDS face in terms of um, uh, you, you know, economies of scale. Um, probably in the next round, um, you can elaborate more on this notion of a SIDS capital um, market, which I believe is um, designed to, or would be designed to overcome some of the challenges related to economies of scale. But, but um, you'll get a second bite of the cherry and, and, you will be, um, and you'll be able to elaborate a bit more. Um, I will now give the floor to our final panelists. Um, um, my very good colleague, the UN resident coordinator in Samoa, Simona Marinescu. Um, Simona, the floor is yours. Um, can you please um, tell us about some of the challenges and the opportunities that a well-designed multi-dimensional vulnerability index or MVI as it's um, being called, um, what are some of the challenges and opportunities that this project will bring to the small island developing states? And what's your assessment of, of um, our uh, ability to get this done in relatively short order? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, ASG Hart. Excellencies, uh, colleagues, just a brief account of the MVI in closing this panel discussions. And I would like to appreciate all the previous speakers, great insights. and. Um, we look like we continue to align our thinking in support of small island developing states. Very briefly, um, just to quote uh, Ambassador Webson, with whom we had another meeting yesterday on this topic, we have all fallen in love with the problem and seem to have difficulties in getting out of, of, of it. And in that regard, I think the last point that uh, the Caribbean Development Bank made is very powerful. We spoke in Antigua recently about the need of considering developing uh, financial markets for uh, to benefit small island developing states, among many other proposals. But just let me um, give a, an update on the index. Uh, at this point in time, there are several indices on the table, which um, is a great way forward towards ensuring that the final index is solid, is strong, and it speaks to the needs of the small island states. The president of the General Assembly established a high-level expert panel uh, with whom we meet regularly. And when I speak about multiple indices, I'm referring to the index that the resident coordinator in small island states, uh, whom I represent here today, developed, and also the Caribbean Development Bank, as well as the Commonwealth um, Secretariat, and uh, um, an adjusted uh, economic uh, index, vulnerability index by UNDP. The MVI itself will be adopted at the 77th General Assembly, as we all have a mandate to ensure that the General Assembly is well equipped to make that decision. This is not, though, the end of the road. So in addition to the index itself, we will need to have a methodology of costing how vulnerabilities uh, generate an impact, and then um, 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 overall a policy of the use of the MVI that brings a series of elements about which uh, some of the previous speakers referred to. Let me just say that our ambition is much higher at this point in time. So the, the mandate we received for the MVI was to be an index to define the special case for development the small island states represent. That has been a request since 
the Barbados program of action through uh, Mauritius and then uh, through the Samoa pathway. And uh, it's not uh, just a coincidence that we are leading this effort from Samoa. The government of Samoa still has a very strong ownership of the Samoa pathway until the next agenda of the small island states will be um, adopted. At this point in time, development financing, and I'm referring to development financing, including equity and including debt and including uh, international public financing, grants made to governments, the ODA, um, is no longer, so the development financing overall is no longer um, based on needs and addressing needs. So from the adoption of the ODA, we have assumed that development is a linear process. And once you get into a certain income category, the higher you go, the lower your needs and your problems. And once you're in an income uh, per capita category, you share the same problems across countries, which is no longer the reality. So overall, development is no longer linear if it has ever been. But at this point in time of multiple crises and, and major global shocks, obviously we talk about more setbacks than advancement. And at the same time, in the same income category, countries are quite diverse. So the NVI is meant to complement the GDP per capita, the GNI per capita, and ensure that we further refine ways in which the development financing is flowing. And um, once uh, the, the index is adopted as a universal parameter, a universal metric, it will be added to the GNI per capita. We are quite encouraged by the response of the international financial institutions, as well as of the OECD as the custodian of the DAC principles, that this will happen. It may take place in you know, more than one step, but it will um, obviously happen at some point. So what we want to ensure is that the MBI is allowing a rethinking of development financing, increasing the quality of development financing, because if we haven't achieved much with the billions and trillions of dollars um, as a channel through development uh, goals, that might be a problem with the criteria and with the overall quality of the financing. And that's the time when we need to talk about that. And as GHART, if I may, we also need to decarbonize development financing. And I'm referring primarily to the ODA, but not only to that. So we look into the, what has happened with private financing coming from Glasgow with such a great commitment of of over 450 players in, in financial markets to decarbonize private financing, 130 trillion, needs to be replicated, needs to be matched by commitment within the public financing, which unfortunately is not yet uh, happening. So also looking into the debt uh, topic that we have been discussing right now here, of course, debt to GDP will never do justice. We, we, think that that service to GDP is actually more solidly speaking about the problems, but at this time of very high inflation, that brings into the element of, of real interest rate that is, is a complex uh, topic. But uh, talking about that servicing, in our discussions, including with the Caribbean Development Bank and others, we spoke about an opportunity to also look into the SDR policy that has not changed over the last three decades, four decades, and, and primarily looking into decoupling the SDRs from the quota. We see some progress in that regard with the recent Resilience and Sustainability Trust. We also talk about the possibility of having the SDRs channeled through development, multilateral development banks, as well as uh, ensuring, for instance, that SDRs could be traded for uh, disaster insurance or for as contributions to resilience funds, as, as uh, the discussion has been uh, earlier today. So we also want the MVI to allow for more uh, needs-specific tailored financing. First of all, the vertical funds would need to have distinct windows for small island states. For vulnerable countries, let me put it that way, so based on the MVI, and we see the SDG fund, the joint SDG fund going into that space, but also some other instruments would need to adopt the same thinking that as you're more vulnerable, you need to have access to financing in a, in a customized, contextualized way. And as Jihart, if I may, the recent uh, uh, 2022 Financing for Development report that was just launched uh, 
this week, last week prior to the EcoSoccer Forum, speaks about the issues that we, ex we, we see across the board in terms of um, lending, with developed countries in general accessing loans at uh, an average interest rate at 3.5%, whereas the developing countries borrow at 14% as an average. So that speaks about the need of, of some new fresh thinking considering the challenges that countries have right now. And in that regard, these parameters is extremely important. And let me close by saying that the um, overall approach to um, the use of the MVI would need to consider how vulnerability affects progress against the SDGs and we have done a good analysis of that and that will be submitted together with the index to the General Assembly and with a particular focus on public spending per capita. So our analysis shows that not the GNI per capita in general is an element that uh, is, is uh, highly correlated with SDG progress but public spending and seeds are today at 7,100 US dollars per capita per year public spending, whereas uh, from 19,000 and above countries are making progress towards uh, the SDGs and more sustainable progress. So while our intention is to use the MVI to advocate for a financing overall at this point in time that would um, rethink the way money is being channeled and decarbonizing funds and ensuring that funds are addressed based on needs, not on indicator that makes wrong assumptions with respect to the development trajectory at this time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simona. Um, colleagues, unfortunately, we have just about five minutes left. Um, we've heard um, some really insightful comments and thoughts on the creativity of finance ministers um, from the Caribbean um, and the Pacific in terms of responding to the challenges of COVID uh, of the COVID-19 crisis, as well as the um, um, common implications of the normalization of monetary policy and the implications of the um, um, from the Ukraine um, crisis and and um but we've also heard really a strong political commitment um from from the ministers present and others um to build resilience in small island developing states to address these challenges so my question to the panelists um you're free to make whatever comments but if you had one message to our to your development partners and to the and to the international community, what would that one message be? I first give the floor to Minister Singh. I'm not sure if Minister Singh has left us. Um, so I turn the floor over um, to the Attorney General of Fiji. Sir, the floor is yours. Hi, uh, thank you. Sorry, I had missed, missed your question. Do you mind putting it again, please? Sorry. Uh, okay, um, sorry. The question is, if you had one message or a series of messages to our development partners, um, what would that message um, be, given the multiple challenges that SIDS face? But what I hear is creativity from you and your response to the COVID crisis and creativity um, by SIDS across the board. So, so what would that one message be to our development partners? I think at this point in time, a key priority would be the way that we look at debt, because I think there's a lot of talk about debt sustainability uh, pertaining to small island developing states, uh, you know, the Caribbean, the Pacific, etc. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier on, there needs to be a more nuanced approach and sophisticated approach to looking at uh, how we measure debt. The reason why I say that is critically important because now people are talking about the fiscal space available to individual countries. Fiscal space in terms of being able to borrow more, fiscal space in terms to be able to expand or have a higher level of expenditure. As we mentioned earlier on, governments at this point in time, because of the very, you know, uh, the muted uh, economic uh, contract, the, sorry, I should say the contraction, massive contraction in the economy, requires government intervention. Now, for us, it, of course, becomes a lot more uh, you know, you know, difficult 
we get a double whammy, as we say, is that we also have climate-related uh, incidences. So even during COVID, when we had a few cases, we, the cyclones did not stop. Uh, in the last cyclone season, we're just coming out of it. Today's the next last, next few days will be the last few days in the cyclone season. We had one cyclone. We had hugely inclement weather that caused massive damage to our infrastructure. Uh, and coupled with that, of course, was the effects of the pandemic. So in terms of measuring debt, the debt architecture, our ability, for example, to have financial instruments and in debt for nature swaps, I think are critically important. My main focus would be, the messaging would be about how we look at debt, uh, how we take a more sophisticated, nuanced approach to debt, and how we're able to facilitate the fiscal space that many of the island states actually do require coming out of the pandemic and to be able to build resilience. You know, we, we cannot be, for example, building the same road over and over again. We cannot be, for example, putting up the electrical cables three, four times in one cyclone season because we don't have the affordability or they don't have the finances to afford to put it underground. Very basic message. Thank you so much, Minister. Um, Justin, over to you. Yes, um, thank you, Salvin. I, um, I think my main message would be that um, I think we understand um, that our debt to GDP ratios are much too high. Um, but yet at the same time, we do need um, considerable amount of financing to finance our adaptation exercises and our projects. And this is where I'm I'm, I want to reiterate the point that I think we do need to develop some type of a SIDS capital market. Um, but when I say a SIDS capital market, I'm not necessarily saying this in terms of getting private capital to then for, for, the, for governments to borrow, but really a SIDS capital market that channels private sector capital directly into the adaptation projects that we require right now so that they don't become a burden on the public finances. They are projects that in themselves are investment opportunities. And so alongside that, I think that our um, development partners have to start thinking about how we can ensure that our governments become adaptation regulators. And I, I mean, I, I can't go into much detail, but the idea there is that governments then facilitate and try to create markets where markets are not currently present so that we can get the private financing to go directly into the projects that will build the resilience and adaptation that we need um, and without overburdening the public accounts um, significantly. So I think that that's, that's, that's my main, main area. It's a, it's a way of that I think we have to start thinking differently if we are going to tackle this um, in a meaningful way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Justin and Simona. One minute, you have the last word. Yes, yes. I, just to summarize what everybody mentioned, uh, as you heard, I think we should use this opportunity of a, a deeply challenging context to reset the button of development financing. We have created the principles governing development financing, and we have the power to change them, to adjust them to this context together. And I think if we miss this year, the opportunity to uh, do so, it is going to be a little more challenging as we recover from the crisis. So as Keynes said, you know, never, never miss a, a good crisis to reset the, the system, the parameters, that's exactly where we are right now. And we see this conversation around the MBI and everyone's solidarity on this topic as taking us to that particular positive outcome. And we are very pleased that, you know, as resident coordinators um, are able to be part of this process. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simona. And colleagues, thank you so much um, for this really great discussion. Um, thank you for many of the creative ideas in terms of what the SIDS themselves can do, but more importantly, what needs to be done at the international level to ensure that we have a more supportive environment, to ensure that these countries, that the small island developing states are, who are countries on the front lines of all of these crises, that these countries are able to develop um, and prosper. So thanks again, and I turn the floor back over to the moderator. Thank you very much. Um, 
um, SG Hart and to the very esteemed panelists that we've had, um, which are very, very interesting interventions. Um, a very um, uh, warm thanks to the Honorable Ministers of Finance for Guyana and Fiji, uh, for Mr. Ram, um, and also for uh, Ms. Marinescu Adelian from Samoa. Um, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we will now proceed uh, following our panel discussion to our closing remarks. And without further ado, we will hand over the floor now to Mr. Dylan Elaine, the Deputy Director for the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and Caribbean, ECLAC. And um, Mr. Elaine will be followed by His Excellency, Mr. Aubrey Webson, per Permanent Representative of Antigua and Barbuda, to the UN and also chairman of AOSIS. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. Are you hearing me? Loud and clear, sir. Thank you very much. This has been a, a, um, a content rich presentation. Uh, Honorable Ministers of Finance, um, Madam Executive Secretary of uh, uh, SCA. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, I, in the interest of time, I'm not going to identify particular presenters, but I'm going to really look at the broad issue that um, caught my attention. Clearly, this is an opportunity for two regions with similar um, challenges to come together, and that was identified as an important issue. Um, it is clear that um, for both the Caribbean and the Pacific, um, this is a triple crisis, crisis of debt, climate, and COVID. Don't let's forget that, that the health crisis is still with us. And um, uh, we, we heard from the, um, on the basis of a uh, uh, presentation made on the Caribbean with respect to um, an initiative to, to lower long-term low-cost financing to the Caribbean. There was discussion of the Caribbean Resilience Fund. Of um, course, another fund, um, the Pacific Resilience Facility, was also discussed. Each of them with a different trajectory, but equally important. Uh, uh, clearly, the debt situation in the Caribbean is different from the Pacific, but we got some very important insights that many of the Pacific territories are more vulnerable than that of the Caribbean. Very interesting. Um, and, and it comes back to the minister's point that we must have a sophisticated approach to understanding this issue. Um, minister Singh made some very important um, interventions. Uh, he argued for resource mobilization, for diversification, fiscal sustainability, and very importantly, a point which it was echoed by several speakers, the need for solidarity and voice, a shared voice between regions on common issues. Uh, we got a very good description of the situation in Fiji, um, very smart policies um, and an emphasis on the need for domestic um, strategies in terms of borrowing, in terms of um, fiscal reforms, and so on, something which is sometimes not sufficiently emphasized. But the point was made that notwithstanding this, um, there is need for uh, an approach to understanding the debt situation in small economies. Um, we also heard about uh, the need to bring these large resources which are needed through the private sector and the fact that the state must be in the business of facilitating such finances through laws, through rules, and so on. And the development of a capital market, very important. Uh, and uh, a SIDS credit rating strategy to assess the performance of state. And the, the state be, be, provides seed resources um, and is not a major financier um, in the SDG development. Very interesting. And of course, 
the discussion on the MDI and um, what is its objective and um, some ideas about how SDRs could be channeled through the MDI. <laughs> part of the recovery um, of SIDS. So, you know, without going into more detail, a rich menu of ideas, some of them emphasizing um, domestic policy, some of them emphasizing voice and uh, uh, solidarity, but all in all recognizing that SIDS are vulnerable and there's a great deal of effort that has to be to, 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 be, to, to be brought to bear to bring the SIDS issue to the international um, attention. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. We now call upon His Excellency, Mr. Aubrey Webson. Can, can you hear me? Loud and clear, sir. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. And I unfortunately joined the discussion a little late, but I think I joined the discussion in some of the richest part of the content that was shared. I heard the, I had the opportunity to hear the ministers and the, the, and the comments and the statements by Simona and Justin and the short rebuttals or short further inputs. I think I'm not going to um, rehash with what McLean has just said, um, but to make just a few very brief comments and suggest some things of the way forward. Three things stand out that strikes me or four. We were very, it's very clear our minister from Guyana, good friend, the minister of finance, and his commitment to, to changes in our de dependency on a mono industry, which is tourism. And many of us are very heavily dependent on tourism. And what COVID-19 did do for many of us in the in small islands in the Caribbean is said to us, return to agriculture somewhat. You've got to know that agriculture is a part because we got to be able to do something about feeding ourselves. So trying to diversify is what I heard the minister speaking of as we, despite our size, despite the, the structures of our societies. And I thought that was really interesting. We heard some very smart local policy as it relates to, um, to, to Fiji and my good minister whom I met, the dear friend, I met him um, in, in, in um, Glasgow and was always impressed with his presentations and to hear the, this very smart approaches taken by Fiji, again, it stands out. And to know that we in the small island nations are constantly being hammered by debt and debt, as he so aptly described, you can be thrust into major crisis, not in weeks or months, but in a matter of hours by a major cyclone or hurricane. And we certainly know that living in, in islands and we know that what that does is forces us often into deeper and deeper debt and finding answers to the debt crisis. And looking at it now with the COVID-19 and the issues that we have faced and some of the smart ways of addressing debt. As somebody said, one of the things COVID has done is reshaped how we count mathematics and, and therefore, the, deficits and as isn't as bedeviled as it was two years ago. It's a matter of understanding and being able to manage the deficit. So that's very in interesting. Justin raised a point that I have been talking about and I was very excited to hear, to hear the point. And that is that a, a SIDS capital market. I think there, there is time as we talk about going, what next? There must be some consideration for small island states speaking across the oceans, the blue, 
to, in order to come together more. This is an exciting project here this morning, this evening, and I have to congratulate ESCAP because what we do not do enough is speak as small islands, as mini states, as mi little micro states and mini states speak across the oceans to each other so we could begin to form alliances and begin to form some sort of a bond that will shape us um, through our own creating markets and creating um, e efforts that could move us up, move us forward together. We continue to be on the coattail of colonial masters former colonial, as former colonies. I think this coming together here is it could be a really good beginning for the way forward of us coming together, not only at climate conferences, but coming together and addressing global challenges that we face as mini and micro states in these small islands. Simona's comments on the MBI is, 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 is well noted because we are deeply engaged in that discussion. We believe as the minister from Guyana so fervently noted that the MBI, um, using the MBI in the context of addressing the vulnerability. We have to keep sure that we address our vulnerability and link to vulnerability is, the, is resilience. And we can't just speak in the negative. We have to understand that we have to address the question of our adaptation so that we can um, shore up our resilience as we take on the challenge and as we live with um, 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 increased um, hurricanes and cyclones. Um, even if we got to 1.5, it is not going to be the savior of us. It is the best of the worst. So we have to find the resilience to live with a 1.5 world. And therefore, this, this is important. I want to say, um, Madam Chair and colleagues, how important it, it is, this event is. And I want to once again congratulate ESCAP for an a, 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 pulling this together and getting colleagues from the Caribbean, colleagues from the Pacific. And I hope we could expand that to colleagues from the ACE region, that we can all come together and form a stronger alliance and begin to build intra-regional collaboration within the um, linking, as, as, as Justice put it, to ex so we can explore private capital markets for SIDS. We can explore efforts of collaboration and development for SIDS, and we can use this as a stepping stone forward. I thank you for giving me this opportunity to say a few words. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, um, Your Excellency, for um, your wonderful um, closing remarks. Uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, um, before we proceed to formally closing very shortly, we kindly seek your indulgence on an administrative matter for um, uh, the evaluation of the post um, uh, side event. It's uh, just on the chat. Um, without further ado, uh, we take this opportunity to um, sincerely thank uh, both ASCAP and ACLAC on behalf of the Secretary General uh, of the Pacific Islands uh, Forum Secretariat. Um, as a post event to our very humble uh, Pacific Regional Debt Conference, mm -hmm. which, was the, which was the first time for the region to convene um, a debt conference in the midst of uh, COVID, uh, as mandated by the regional finance ministers. Um, the opportunity to have this site event at Ecosoc has um, exceeded our expectations. And we are extremely grateful for the spirit of, uh, of, uh, of unity, the spirit of collaboration, and the spirit of uh, working together uh, as an alliance, not only under AOC, but also as small island developing states with shared issues, uh, shared um, debt trajectories, and uh, uh, unifying and amplifying our voice uh, to uh, our creditors to address uh, what are normally during um, perhaps uh, normal times, we may not get the opportunity to, to discuss um, and really uh, uh, be in attention to. So uh, on behalf of um, the secretariats and uh, all the participants 
the uh, speakers and the panelists, we take this opportunity once again to thank everyone for your time this afternoon or this morning. And we now formally call the event to a close. Thank you and Thank you, Chair. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Ambassadors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alberto. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.